Looking forward to talking about Alice Darling, of course, and some of the great work that you've done. But I first, in doing research and preparation for this, I really want to talk about your your upbringing because I'm amazed by the stories of your mother and your sisters and yourself and just how much uh, activism you grew up with. So I kind of wanted to start um, by giving your mother uh, the props that she deserves. Did you want to tell the audience what she was able to accomplish with Mohawk Mothers in October? Um, yeah, wow, you did your research. Um, so my mom, uh, Gondineta Horn, is now 82. But ever since she was basically a teenager, she's she joined the movement. She was a big part of of the civil rights movement in the 60s and and then in the 70s she kind of quieted down to sort of uh well to be a mother and then in the 80s then 1990 happened in Oka and she kind of got she jumped you know back into uh, activism so I was around five years old then and I grew I I was at Oka at the at the 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 standoff in Oka that summer. I, that's how I grew up. I grew up at meetings, at rallies, you know, in the back of a car, going to various places <laughs> with my mother, listening to her talk and everything. Uh, and so I now have just this like great admiration for my mother, especially because it's something that keeps her mind going. And my mother and her her women's group have managed to stop the uh, expansion and demand that they excavate first. And that is like a huge thing because they didn't have any lawyers and they represented themselves. And it's just massive. And it's I'm, I'm so incredibly proud of my mother at 82 years old to be doing to be continuing the fight and doing this. And, you know, I always love her answer when she's like, you know, when some people are like, oh, you know, oh, you did it wrong, or you should have done this. And she's like, so I was like, well, what have you done? What did you do? Did you do anything? You know, like, it's, it's so easy for people to jump down somebody's throat. But when they're sitting on their couch, not doing anything, and my mom is out there doing things. So that's the long answer to your question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, a, a, an amazing history deserves a long answer. So you should be very proud. Um, it's interesting, though, because you kind of touched on it, because my next question was, of course, was it this kind of teenage or youth rebellion that brought you into performance? Because I know your mom was also a model at one point. Art must have been a part of your life. But having grown up in that environment, what all of a sudden triggered the fact that you wanted to be a performer? Uh, art really wasn't in my life. <laughs> um, I think that my parents grew up in a time where they weren't and and, and in a and in a class where they weren't allowed to or they, where they really had to sort of just they had to make a living right they didn't have time to like mess around um my dad was a lawyer or is retired now but he was a lawyer and he told me how he had you know wanted to be he loved he liked performing and he's like but being a lawyer is almost like performing you know you're performing when you're when you're inter not interrogating but you know cross examining a witness and all this stuff and um i think there are elements of art and performance within my parents but and my mom is a absolutely amazing painter oddly enough but i always wanted to do it i just i realized at a young age, oh, acting is something that you can get paid to, like, this is a job, this is a thing that you could do. And then I was just fixated on it. When I was a teenager in theater school, I remember asking my mom, like, what the hell does an actor have to contribute to the movement, to like, right. to, to Indigenous anything, you know? I'm like, I just feel like I'm doing it because I like doing it. Like my first love is acting. It wasn't this desire to approach it in like a political way it, that just sort of like fell in line. And it, then I found myself like answering these questions like, like, oh, yeah, I guess I am kind of doing this representation thing and, um, you know, changing people's perceptions. And and I, I think I I've found a way to sort of use my art and my writing and and podcasting 
uh, to, it felt like a really organic way that I got to, you know, use my voice and, and, and change people's perceptions and stuff like that. I don't know, like you just say what's on your mind. Like I remember I was on Canada Reads and they were like, you come from a family of activists and blah, blah, blah. And so are you, and I was like, I just was taught that if you see something and it's not right, you got to say something, right? Yeah. Um, so if that's activism, then I guess, <laughs> I guess I'm an activist. Yeah. So the, the great thing I was going to touch on was I love that your career has really been defined by your Canadian moments. I mean, you've been in larger Hollywood productions, but you've got this great Canadian flavor to it. I was going to touch on the Trotsky because it's a personal favorite, underrated film. Mm -hmm. And I hadn't even realized until recently that that was a young Jacob Tierney that yeah. had done that and you were a part of. But I want to touch on because it's a, a perfect segue to what you were just talking about. Mm -hmm. Being a consulting producer now uh, on Shorzy, and the great representation that I've seen recently in productions, especially Canadian productions, is a start, obviously. Mm -hmm. What are some of the pratfalls that you think should be avoided when we're addressing, you know, First Nations storylines in television and film? My thing is <clears throat> sort of just making sure that it remains authentic and it isn't just shoving it down people's throats like you know I think the the revolutionary thing about Shorzy is that they just happen to be native that half the cast you know happens to be native because you can't do a, ho a hockey show in Canada and not have indigenous people a part of it especially if it's like up north you know right in Sudbury um and I think if you just like sit back and like let these people just B, <laughs> yeah. and if they want to wear beaded whatever, or if they want to, you know, then, and it doesn't interrupt in the storyline or doesn't, you know, then just let them do their thing, you know? I mean, we just want to exist. It doesn't have to be like a, a shaman or a, I don't know, um, a drunken person. Like we just exist where there's lots of, there, we, we're nerds, we're athletes, we're, whatever there's so many different you know types of us and it's just like all we want to do is exist on the big screen and in real life you know well and i think that's what people absolutely love about your role in letter kenny is she's just such a, a great part you know i can't imagine the show without tanis to be honest I guess her, but see the the difference between her and sh in the the indigenous characters in shorzy mm -hmm. is like i felt like in letter kenny i was like I mean, I love Tannis. I, I, I kind of approached her like she's like everybody else is a cartoon character, right? So yeah. I kind of came out with, I'm like, I don't want a, a little medall beaded medallion. I was like, I want a medallion the size of a CD. <laughs> well, you young people, CDs were these discs. <laughs> with music, find one, sometimes yeah. DVDs. <laughs> um, <laughs> so with her, I felt like because she was the only one amongst all of these non-Indigenous people, um, I had to come in like hard, you know, and like really yeah. like over represent, like, I didn't want nails this long. I wanted them that long. <laughs> I wanted, you know what I mean? And, yeah. um, and I think with Shorzy, there's so many of them that you don't really have to like come in and like make a statement in that respect. You know what I mean? Right. So, right. Um, yeah, but I, I adore Tannis and, and she is somebody that I, I just, I love having fun with and playing with. Yeah. On that note of having fun, because I, I, I heard that part of the motivation to get into performing was Jim Carrey, that you really enjoyed his performances growing up. And so on that note, when on set, who is the one actor that keeps you laughing that you can almost not keep a straight face when you have a scene together? Jacob Tierney. Really? Okay. I love it. I can see that. Completely. In the episode where we're in the church, it's the last it's the last season. And I just think partially because I've known him for so long, I just already think he's hilarious in right. life, you know? Um, and then he does this character and he he's an incredible improviser and he also like, you know, is is the director of the show. So he I don't know, he's just 
he's just hilarious if you yeah. you watch that episode and i'm like looking at him and i'm watching him go i'm i'm not acting <laughs> I'm legitimately like this guy is fucking hilarious <laughs> <laughs> okay let's talk about alice darling because uh, this has been you know released at tiff in september and obviously in wider release now which is fantastic i want to talk about the canadian aspect of it first that you know, again, filmed, um, I believe, in the Toronto area, right, in Ontario. Is there a, a little bit of um, kind of an authenticity that you can bring to a character knowing it's a Canadian production, regardless if the character herself is Canadian? I feel like because everybody, aside from Anna and Woonmi, everybody, in, I mean, in the, in the crew and everybody is from Canada, and, and we weren't, you know, it was Toronto for Toronto, right? Like yeah. we were playing at Toronto for Toronto and basically up north for up north, you know? Yeah. Um, we weren't trying to pretend, which is what I, I really appreciate. I mean, even in my own career's lifetime, I've noticed and I, and I love and I appreciate that, you know, when somebody from Canada writes a movie, but they always said it in some random, like something, Michigan, you know? And it's like, <laughs> why? can't we set it here you yeah. know what's wrong with here we have so many stories we have so many layers to the people here um and so i think just like having you know indigenous people which we need more indigenous people in crews and stuff like that when when telling and not not just when telling indigenous stories but when telling indigenous stories just like that i think that when you have a whole bunch of people from canada you know paying attention to the the art direction, the hair, makeup, everything, you know, there's, there's all those little details, um, make it authentically Canadian. I mean, Anna didn't have to change her accent or anything. She, she sounded, you know, pretty good, like pretty, uh, uh, I mean, I didn't, I wasn't like, oh my God, you sound like you're from Texas. But there was this one time where she was, she was like, should I try to say a I'm like yeah and I had like coached her like how to say it they did not keep that take in but it was funny I was trying not to laugh the whole time because she was trying to she's like I forget what the line was but it was just something like blah 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 blah, blah eh? I mean if when I say it it's very authentic right. <laughs> because it's just part of my vocabulary but her it was so it was like yeah I understand why they didn't use that it was <laughs> 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 let's not push it Anna <laughs> Speaking of authenticity, a little bit of a heavy question, if you forgive me in advance, but I had noticed that you had spoken out against um, one of the teachers that you had at Dawson, and you had mentioned you were so young at the time as well, and there were allegations against this teacher of inappropriate behavior and sexual abuse. Was there any authenticity, sad to say, was there any authenticity to your character and your performance as Tess, where you're kind of realizing the same thing like there's something wrong here this is inappropriate did you draw upon any experience for that i mean my character wasn't going through anything except for losing her friend mm -hmm. so the things that i had to draw on were more my own experiences in relationships uh i think you know because it wasn't necessarily i think if this story had something to do with an authority figure and wrong things there, then maybe I would have, you know, drawn on, you know, or thought about or discussed uh, things that happened at Dawson. I mean, nothing explicit happened to me, but yeah. there were ways that I look back and I'm like, oh yeah, that's fucking messed up. Like I, and then that behavior, you know, kind of affected the rest of my you know career career for at least 10 years where I was I didn't speak up or I didn't you know advocate for myself because I just thought that stuff was normal you know so but in the case of of Alice Darling no I more thought of all of my horrible relationships that I've had since I was 15 years old so I but I didn't necessarily use them to inform my uh performance it was more to understand uh what Alice was what Anna's character Alice was going through and how I could best support that in the in the friendship and also support you know Anna offset or, or not offset but like you know when the cameras aren't rolling you know we shared a lot of stuff because she was extremely vulnerable in her performance um 
arguably one of her best performances I've ever seen. Absolutely. Um, yeah. You know, I think to tackle something like this, the four of us, like myself, the two actresses and the director, you know, we shared a lot of, um, we shared a lot of experiences that we have had. So, yeah. So I, I think I'm more focused on the, uh, the horrible relationships that I've been in. <laughs> well, well, sad to say, but again, your performance is um, amazing. And like I said, all three of you are very authentic, I think, in this movie. So it came through. All right. On a lighter note, before I let you go, we've had 11 seasons of Letter Kenny. I'm not even sure how many it's been. I think 12 or 13. 12. I don't know. I don't know. I don't amazing. Know. Love it. I don't it. even know, actually. <laughs> Legitimately, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's the Canadian little engine that could because it just keeps chugging along. And more importantly, it gets an international audience, which I love. I love seeing Americans reacting to clips online and, and getting a little taste. So I pose it to you. Could the show keep going on forever? Or more importantly, how about a Tana spinoff? We got Shorzy. You know, you, you, she could do her own show, I think. I mean, it is the world that would be the one that makes the most sense to explore. So I wouldn't be opposed to doing like a movie, a Tannis movie or something. Nice. Or a Tannis limited series, something like that. For sure. I love Tannis and I love, um, she, you know, I, I almost like grew up with her in a way. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think a lot of Canadians have grown up with her at this point as well. So. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> well, Kenyatia, thank you so much for your time. Uh, best of luck with Alice Darling. Best of luck in the future with Letter Kenny as well. And I really appreciate talking to you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Hey, Real Students, thanks for watching. If you want to subscribe to Real School, click that round Real School logo right beside me. Also, click that damn notification bell so you're aware of all of Real School's new content. You can follow me on Twitter, and of course, if you get anything out of Real School, you can always give a little back. Just click the link in the description below or the button down there, and you can become part of my Patreon team.